Panteers, and welcome to today's panel discussion with Lou, Melanie, Brad, and Oscar. The last session with this group received a lot of questions, and so did this one. They will get through as many questions as they can in the 45 minutes that they have. If you have not yet checked out our upcoming webinars, Oscar is in several of them, and check them out at www.leanfrontiers.com forward slash online learning. With that, I will hand it over to them. Thanks, Skylar, and as always, thank you very much to Lean Frontiers for being the platform for this. So as per last time, yeah, we had a lot of questions submitted, and as soon as we finished, I thought it would be um, appropriate if we could have another crack at this, because obviously you guys are out there, really appreciated listening to Melanie, Lou, and Brad. So just as a quick introduction, Melanie started a career at a local hospital over 20 years ago as a student uh, x-ray tech. She's now COO of the NEA Baptist Health System, a um, the hospital there, with it, which employs over 2,000 people with a wide range of professional diversity from facilities maintenance to physicians. Brad has spent 33 years in the public sector in New South Wales in Australia, um, 21 of which was in policing, the remaining 12 years in local or count, what you guys, Americans would call county councils. So he's had many and varied situations where his results were dependent on others. And just a point I missed with Melanie, the thing I really love about having someone like Melanie involved is she speaks with a lot of enthusiasm and from the heart, as you'll see. And then lastly, Lou uh, is a practicing rheumatologist in Cincinnati, Ohio, serving as the division head of rheumatology at the Christ Church Hospital. He has this very deep belief in servant-led leadership and, and as you'll discover, practices that and has a lot of humility. I suspect his achievements and success are deeper than what he lets on. So let's get straight into the questions. The first question, and we, we, have, we had about 80 submitted this time around, so there's no way known we're going to get through that many. Uh, but the first question, and it's a really good one, and it's a pretty obvious one when you think about it, uh, was from Alonso Rojas, and he asks, what does respect for people mean? So Lou, can you have a crack at that one? It's a really obvious one. Perhaps we should have thought of that ourselves. But what does respect for people mean? Lou. Uh, great question. And I suspect we could probably all spend hours talking about that. Um, when I think about that, I, I, I drop back to the, the, the kind of the Judeo-Christian values. And it's been interesting to me as I look at servant leadership and talk to friends of mine who are deeply religious and ask them to boil down either the Torah or the Bible to its essence. And almost always what comes back is this idea of love thy neighbor as thyself. And what's fascinating to me is that the preface to that above love thy Lord above all love thy neighbor as thyself. And, and I think for me, at least this idea of respect for people is caring equally for myself as I am for others, not more for myself, not more for others, but keeping that balance. If within the workplace, if I am not doing what's best for myself, I'm not going to be doing what's best for the organization. On the other hand, if I'm giving too much to the organization, not taking care of myself and my family, I'm not able to give as much. Um, on the other hand, if I'm trying to take too much for myself, I'm not doing as well either. So that's my crack at it. Um, but uh, again, I think we could spend hours on that question. Yeah. So alignment and balance is two things that I picked up there. Uh, the second question sort of ties in, and Lou, if you can grab that as well, because it's a little bit related. Why is it important to build trust in the workplace? Oh, I love that. That That's a phenomenal question. And to me that, you know, as I've been, Oscar and I, Oscar hosted a um, master's meetup not too long ago and part of the theme there was, was servant leadership. And as a few emails have been going back and Oscar, I appreciate you reading my novels. Um, <laughs> that I... There is a bit of depth in them. I have to do it when, I'm, um, when my mind's fresh, I must admit, Lou. So I appreciate you taking the time and looking at them. Um, but it, one, of the, one of the things that came out from, 
as we were going back and forth on some things that came out of that master's meetup is um, I came across Maslow's hierarchy of needs in a format that I hadn't seen before. I don't know if I'll be able to show you this, but it, at the very That's top, clear. your self-actualization. And what's been, what's interesting to me is that in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at least in this one, they say, as you move up on this, there's decrease deficiency needs and motivation decreases here but as you get to the very top it's self-actualization motivation increases when i think when you're in a place where you feel safe and you're trusted and when they, i think the best organizations are looking for the gifts the talents and the ambitions of the individuals and they're trying to help every individual grow to their fullest in which case there has to be trust there but they can align the growth of the four of us with our internal motivation and we're all pulling in the same direction and when that occurs watch out um so i i think to get to and so why is it important to build trust i th i think Think it's loving thy neighbor as thyself when we do that when you get yeah, that sort of in an organization good and brad and melanie um both of you well brad you've gone new into an organization uh in the last 12 months and melanie you've gone to a new role reasonably recently uh melanie what are you you know in that situation or for both of you melanie if you could go first why is it important to build trust in the workplace why with you going into that new role if you didn't have trust what would what would be the consequence well, personally for me, I think without trust, it's really hard to achieve much of anything in the workplace, especially um, any type of improvement work. And so I do believe that trust is vital and it only comes though by um, having respect first. So your first question was absolutely the right question to have first is because without respect, then we will not have trust between two individuals at any given time. And so for me, I, I, I go back to the re respect question because <clears throat> one of the reasons why and how I think we can ensure that we're showing respect as leaders is we have to make sure that we understand that the ones doing the work are the ones creating value. And so for me as a manager, very early in my career, really my first management job, I realized, so manager's radiology, I realized very quickly that um, I had to, to help support those actually doing the work, that that was my full, that was my role. And so I've always viewed that my role is to help those who are helping take care of our patients, because the ones at the bedside are the ones that are creating value. They're the ones that are creating, you know, providing compassionate care. So my job as a leader has always been, how can I support those that are actually doing the work? And so I think if we remember that, if as leaders, if all leaders remember that they cannot get anything done without those that they are leading. So I, that's why I love JR. I love that first part of the training of where, you know, the first thing that you go through is how think of all the job duties that you have as a leader and then tell me how many of those you actually do yourself or how many are actually done by the people that you are managing. And so to me, that critical piece of JR training is to remind even those who, of us who've been in leadership for 20 years, I think it's a great reminder that you really can't do anything alone. You'll never, I can never do anything by myself. Everything that gets done in this organization is done by somebody else. And you know, what I also love to tell managers as I'm doing the training is I'll say, if you don't think that you, if you think you can do it all by yourself, then send everybody home for the day and see how exactly. many patients get taken care of. And, you know, everybody always laughs and jokes and they realize very quickly, yeah, you know, if I'm the director of radiology, the director of pharmacy or the director of lab or facilities, yeah, if I sent all my people home, man, I would be struggling because I would be one person trying to do this by myself. And, and in many cases, they've been far removed from that work for quite some time that they would not be nearly as efficient to be able to go in there and try to do that work. And so I think that's, a, that's one way that I can help remind people to um, treat others with respect is because, as Lou said, you do want to treat others as you want to be treated. So that's, that's one way to think of, of that. But you also have to remember that 
your people are your most valuable asset. Um, you can't do anything without them. And so for me, that is respect has to be first in order to then build, build trust. So then in order to build trust, though, I think you do have to make sure that your people feel comfortable bringing you ideas that may or may not work. And I think that if you come to a place where as a leader, someone brings you an idea or a suggestion that you quickly shut down, then that trust will be broken because then they're not going to feel comfortable in the future of bringing you some very good ideas that you need to hear about. And so eventually they'll become apathetic. They will not uh, participate or engage. And when you lose that engagement or that participation and that communication from your team, then you're not going to yield great results um, overall. And eventually that individual will likely leave the organization because they don't feel that their ideas and their opinions and their feedback is truly heard. And so I think to, to get trust, you have to listen and you have to give feed, you have to be open to feedback and you have to be okay that sometimes the information that they give you is not perfect. And if, if it's a bad idea, okay, it's a bad idea. And we're okay with that because a bad idea is better than no ideas at all. Uh, spot on. I like that, how you went back to the, uh, where value is added in your world is at the bedside. Uh, care is provided at the bedside and we get our results through people, which is the essence of JR, spot on. Uh, Lou, can you, uh, sorry, Brad, could you comment too, please on, Importance of building trust in the workplace because you've gone into a new role a year or so ago and you yeah. will have confronted that. Yeah, I'm two years coming up now, Oscar. Um, two, oh, is so it really? Think, wow. Yeah, I suppose to build on Lou's um, biblical reference, I, I, I think as a leader, new leader, quite often you have um, people who will give you faith because it, faith can be given, but trust has got to be earned. And so you, they have faith in you when you first come that you've got a mandate or you're new quite often. So you've got to very quickly. Um, turn that around into trust as best you can. You can only do that through credibility. Um, as touches on what Melanie was saying, um, you've got to, you've got, they've got to be able to uh, feel uh, safe in, in coming to you with problems and all those sorts of things. But I think a big part of being a leader is also building a narrative or a story. Um, if you come into an organisation and what you're saying doesn't align with what they see as the problem, if you don't identify the problems in the organisation and able to articulate and understand them, you'll very quickly lose your people because they think you don't understand. So you've got to, and you've got to be able to then articulate where you want to go. Um, and, and hopefully that, that resonates with them as where they think they need to be. Um, so the first thing is you've got to do a bit of get the facts. Um, and you know, if you come in waving a JR card to a new organization, they won't know what you're even on about. So they've got to see the why, um, and you can articulate that in many different ways. But if you're a good, I suppose, able to be a, a bit of a storyteller and, a, and a, give a good narrative and explain why, people, why, why we've got to change the way we operate. Um, because it, you can get a, a sugar hit of, of, I suppose, action through, um, through your position, through fear, through rules, all sorts of things. But to get that meaningful, long-standing change, which really transforms an organisation, you've got to lay a, a platform of trust and make sure that it's built on, you know, um, ongoing and very visible um, actions that reflect what you're saying. So do what you say, say what you do. All those things build trust. And then, then once once they've got a, I suppose, a view that you, you see feel there's a some alignment, they're ready for that next step, which is going into a JR program or similar. Um, it, it, I would always say you've got to get in first and get your facts yourself and and understand your organisation before you lead in, unless it's part of your mandate, but yeah, that's what I'd say. I guess in that timing, um, I know Ben's doing a fair bit of JR training now with your organisation now, and that's that timing you're talking about. I mean, you've been there two years, which I didn't realise that. So that, uh, yes, you've obviously taken some time to get your facts and get your head around it first before you um, start heading down a certain path. That sort of ties in, and that question came from Lewis Chan, I'm sorry. That question of why is it important to build trust. Brad, uh, a question's come from Jessica Hunt, and if you could answer this as well. And I don't, the question, I'll read the question, and then I just want to clarify uh, an implication. It says from Janet, uh, Jessica, how do you build trust on a team that has worked together for years, you're new, 
and the team is broken. Now, I'm not asking you this question because the implication is the team's broken, but, but I'm really asking it from the point of view, they've worked together for years and you're new. So how do you build trust on a team? And have you really part answered that in what you just said? Very similar, I would suggest, is that you, you don't rush in and make assumptions. The team's yes. been together a long time um, and they've all got their, um, I suppose, views and, 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 and their own story. So you, you've got to try and understand um, the, the broken pieces. You've got to understand how that's occurred, uh, if you can. Um, and then then you've got to uh, get very quickly try and get that trust that, that what, what you're offering... Um, is addressing what they see as the problem, provided it aligns with what is the problem with the organisation. But it's that respect piece. So um, if, if you come in and just say, well, things have got to change, get out of my way, um, a, a team that is broken will, will generally fight or flight. Um, I, I think it's, it is getting that deep understanding of, of where your people are coming from. And, and from, from that, you can build. So again, it's about building that narrative again, that story that, that all the good leaders do is is to bring people with them, and but part of that is recognising and respecting what they've been through, um, and, and not looking for blame as, a, as another big thing is is to try and try and look for solutions rather than trawl over. I suppose a lot of the, the wreckage that may be there, um, there's not much value in that. So you've got to try and keep focus on the, the forward journey rather than uh, the retrospective aspects. So what I've heard from both of you, in essence, I think is, is uh, and how do you do all this stuff that you guys are talking about um, and is the practicing of the foundation. So rather than, it's not, you, might, in, in it, you are in some ways using the four step method because you have an objective, uh, but it's really the practicing of the foundations that is going to be pivotal <clears throat> um, in, from what both of you have, you know, in actually doing what both of you have said, the, the, uh, the use of the foundations and the daily practicing of the foundations is going to be a, a key ingredient in being able to get where you want to go, I would imagine. Thanks, Brad. So Jennifer Ayres Lou has asked, uh, and this sort of links in, she's asked, what is the first step in helping organisations understand the value of JR? Lou. Your microphone's off, Lou. Sorry, the dogs were running around. Um, What's the first step in helping organizations understand the value of JR? Yes. So that's a, it's a fascinating question is from conversations I've had with people like Oscar and um, Patrick and Skip, I think maybe the, from my vantage point, I'd look at what, what are the values of the organization? And as I look at organizations, I, there's some blurring, but I, I kind of break them down into two buckets. One bucket is a profit-driven organization. Another bucket is a higher purpose-driven organization. And in the higher purpose-driven organization, the, I would suggest that profit is still important, but it's not the primary drive. It's a byproduct of doing great work. And if you're in a higher purpose driven organization, I think the feedback loop for humans is that, why do we go to work in our place <clears> of <throat> employment? We go to work first and foremost to keep a roof over our head and food in our bellies. And then when we're really lucky to be in a place of employment that allows us to get to our intrinsic motivation and really grow our fullest, man, we just thrive. and in, if an organization has those values and they understand those values, I think the JR pieces are gonna click right away. On the other side though, if an organization's values are how much can we make, how can we squeeze people to get more and more out of them, I don't think the alignment is gonna be there and JR won't fit. And so helping them find their values, I think would be the what are the values that you believe in would then allow them to see whether or not JR is going to be a good fit within their organization is my thought. Lou, I like your honesty there. Um, and the, and the reality of that honesty is that it's not, is it's not going to be a good fit 
um, if we have an if we have an organisation that's essentially uh, tightening the screws and tightening the screws and tightening the screws um, on the people and the way they work. Um, it is reality, and that's why uh, we all often get asked and often say that um, the other J programs tend to sit horizontal in an organisation, really relatively close to the value add point, but for, uh, JR transcends an organisation and ideally starts from the top. So good, thank you for your honesty there. Mel, Tim McMahon has asked, and this again ties in a little bit uh, with the last question to some degree. Tim McMahon has asked, what do you have? Uh, what tips do you have for new or first-time leaders, Melanie? If you could take that question, please. My first tip is to get involved in JR class very early on. Uh, we have learned that uh, through our Cata project of the deployment of JR, we did identify that you don't want to take JR too quickly because you do need some real life people issues to um, practice with. So we kind of found here at NEA Baptist that 90 days after becoming a new manager was really where we needed to at least have gone through the 90 day period and then put them in the JR class. So we do that really early on. So I would say that that is very, you know, most important probably first step is to making sure that we are getting them in a JR class very, very early on. Because even for me after, you know, I'd been in management 15 years when I went through the JR class and um, I still learned so much uh, during that class. And in reflection, and even in the class that I was in, I can remember managers who'd been managing for a very long time saying, wow, I wish I would have had this class a long time ago because I always thought that it was just my job to enforce the rules. I never really realized that it was more so my job to inspire others, to support others, and to be able to answer the why behind some of the, the policies and procedures that we have in healthcare. And so for me, that was really eye-opening because you had individuals in the class who had been managing for 20 plus years that really never understood and had never really been taught how to be leaders. They had been given a management title and felt that it was just their job to enforce the policies and procedures, to staff appropriately, and to um, make sure daily operations were functioning. But they really had no idea the people side and how difficult it is to manage individuals and how each person is different and is unique. And so for me, JR is extremely important. The other tip that I would give is that as a new manager, you have to do more um, listening, ask more questions instead of coming in and telling people how to do things. You know, a lot of times I think managers believe that as now I'm in this management role, so it's my job again to have all the answers to all the questions, to be able to tell people what to do. I think that's just a, a stigma that management equates to telling people what to do and so I think that and in the old command and control management style that that's very true and so I think until you've really uh, gone through JR you managers don't understand that it's really their their job just to build a relationship with their team so that they can lead their team to um, get the results that you're looking for and so the other tip would just be to ask more questions and to listen more and to not go in there and try to tell your team um, how you think things need to happen. Um, but listen and trust those that are doing the work again. Even though you have experience maybe in that field, I think that um, you have to, to make sure that you're being humble and coming in and doing a lot more listening than you are speaking. Hey, Oscar, do you mind, Melanie, do you mind sharing the story about the, the um, first line, that nurse manager that you've shared a number of times, because I think it fit, plays right in here, that managed for 20 years and learned JR. And to me, that do you know what I'm talking about? You've shared that a number of times on one of the videos as well. That, that just, I mean, she really did believe that it was her job just to... Uh, 
enforce the rules. So she was always looking for ways to just write people up. So if they didn't enforce, if they didn't follow the rules, then she would come in and she felt that that was only her, that was her job to be able to enforce the rules and, and if needed, write them up for not following whatever policy that they had, um, that they had broken. And then over time, after she learned JR, she learned that it was, um, it, that was not her role at all. And then in some, she even made this comment. She said, um, now looking back, one, I've probably terminated people that I should not have terminated. And, th and then she did a self-reflection to realize that it may have been that she wasn't educating people properly. So it may not have been a, a people issue at all, but more so a management issue in the fact that she was not listening and open to looking at how she was managing her team. One that of the that, as you've shared that over the years, one of the things that stands out very profoundly to me is that she was in a top-down leadership role and there was separation of her from the community. It was us and that, me and them yeah. in this enforcing role where, as you've told that story before, I get goosebumps just hearing about it, how she becomes a part of the community again. And her life is just restored to some degree. Yeah. Um, Louis, thank you. Yeah, it's, 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 and it's, um, it's interesting how, for me, how JR, JR can change your perspective. Uh, it, that's what happened when I, when we did the training back in two, in the uh, 2010 or 2011, it might've been, and it was an immediate change of perspective, for, certainly for me. Uh, and when we went to, then went to America to do the training uh, or to, to learn more about TWI, I was interested that JI was, I was expect. you know, what, we went there on the, on the premise that, you know, we, we want to, we need to get started on JR in particular, but I was interested that um, JI was the job instruction was the one that seemed to have all the uh, presence, if you like. Uh, and I didn't quite, um, I was going to say, I couldn't quite understand that. Uh, because to me, the, found, the JR and the, particularly the foundations are fundamental to everything that you do, yeah. uh, whether it be Toyota Carter, whether it be job methods, whether it doesn't really matter. Uh, anything you try to bring in, the foundations, particularly of job relations, are fundamental to all of them. Um, and that's what I hear through that story as well, that when you grab those fundamentals, and when I say grab them, that means you practice them, not just know them. Uh, it can completely change your view of the world. Uh, and I think that's a good story. In, as that, far yeah, as in that case, it changed that woman's life, I think, very profoundly. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. Oscar, I'm going to break with Lean Doctor, and I, I always find that people are both the cause of and solution to all your problems. <laughs> people do cause problems, but they also are the ones who solve them. Yeah. Yes. And if you and to Melanie's point, if you try and do all the solving yourself, or you run, uh, then you are essentially you're going to go mad. There's only there's only going to be one outcome to that. So you would need to bring people up so they uh, so so your results come through them, which is underpins lean, uh, underpins JR. Brad, um, if you can keep talking. So Jade Hudek has asked, um, what are practical tips for getting this started and for leadership buy-in? Yeah, I suppose most practically is, um, as I said before, understanding your workplace. And you give examples. JR is very easy to sell, to, and it's to build on, I suppose, when we lose. Most, most managers and or leaders uh, are given humans on an organisational chart and a line of control, as I say, command control, um, with no instruction manual on how to do that. Um, my, my workforce... Um, is you're very used to dealing with plant and, and equipment and assets um, and they've been given, given manuals and they've got to have tickets before they operate, all those sorts of things go on. And then when you point out, well, where, where's your ticket to operate a human? Um, they sort of look at you and go, what do you mean? And then when they do the training, they get it very quickly. So you, you've got to put it in the context of your organisation and use those advantages. And that's what we've found. And you know, everyone has that conversation, are leaders made or are they born? Um, was, and it's both. But they have, there's a far bigger majority that require to be made. They don't have intuitive gut feel instincts that do JR principles just intuitively. But, but this gives everyone a, a very 
simple means of, of, of um, providing leadership guidance and managing people. Um, so it's it's about just knowing that time. It is, it is and it'd be different for all organisations, but it's not hard to walk in an organisation that doesn't have any sort of focus on um, leadership training to identify a time when it's good to, good to do it because usually there's big problems um, and you just use it in that, in that context. So I would just say that you, you've got to just go in and, and first understand the organisation, put it in a context that's going to work within whatever you do as a business, um, work out how you're going to play that in. Uh, but generally it is, it, it's a universal thing and that's why it works across so many different sectors is because it's when it's down to basically how to, how to help people lead other people, um, that's it's a boom industry. It's going on everywhere, and you you can you can find the need pretty quickly and and, and get the pull rather than the push. Brad, I love the way you said that about the instruction manual. My um, this is not workplace related, but my brother had three daughters, three nieces, and he I heard him say to them many times. Unfortunately, you were not born with an instruction manual. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, Oscar in Australia, and it's, it is a bit uh, sexist. Males are famous for throwing away instruction manual, manuals and trying to erect things on intuitively and we stuff it up yes. every time. I think we're yes. the same as leaders. Women, yes. women are quite often much better at it. <laughs> yes, agree. So, um, you know, what JR brings from my perspective is a, a set of principles and philosophies um, and particularly the four, the four foundations are a, a, pr a guiding principles. They're not an, it's not an instruction manual, it's guiding principles of the way we behave uh, to get results through people. Spot on. Well done. Thank you. Lou, uh, Doug, Han and I apologise, Doug, if I've got the pronunciation wrong. Doug Hanawalt has, said, has asked, what is a good exercise to keep in, to keep doing in practice? Uh, what is a good exercise to keep in practising utilising JR on the job over time? So I think what he means is what's a good, what's a good discipline or a good practical way of making sure we, you keep, or we keep JR at the forefront? That's another great question. Um, you know, we've tried different things. One of the things that I, partly I think is it, JR in general, right? One of, one, the, one of the foundations is making the best use of each person's ability. And within our, my team in my office, there were people that are naturally good at certain things. Um, you know, one of the things that I really love doing is looking for each person's ability and especially for abilities that aren't being used. And so if within your teams, you can say who's really good at spotting when something has done, when somebody has let each person know how they're doing, who's good at giving both positive and negative feedback. And working that in it at one point we had made a um, kind of a training grid where we asked everybody we had the four foundations laid out on a grid and asked everybody on a daily basis to pick one of the four foundations and try to look to, to use those with others and to rotate those um, but I, I i think when it becomes really part of the when it's baked in is when you can find the people that are best at certain things um, rebecca in our office is very good at respectfully correcting when people are doing something a little bit outside of the standard um, and again one of the things i like doing is looking for the gifts of the individuals and and figuring out how to line that up so that making the best use of each person's ability. Um, I, Oscar, again, I appreciate you reading my novels that I send back and forth. And I, within that, I shared how Rebecca in my office, what, she, what really gets her out of bed every morning is being a great mom. And knowing that she wants to be a great mom, we work hard within the office to get her as good a pay as she needs so she can work as few as hours as possible so that she can be home being a great mom. But I'll tell you, when she is in the office, she will work anybody under the table because I think that give and take works there. So hopefully- I that like that story. I was hoping you were gonna bring that up. I was gonna prompt you if you didn't, that, that, that story. It's very good. It's, 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 yeah, it's spot on. 
there's another Vernice in the office just has an incredible gift where people will open up to her. There's just, she is just somehow she'll meet somebody for the first time and they'll open up that they're having problems with drug addictions or one thing or another. And that insight um, then can feed back to us. And so as a, a community helping care for this patient, we've got this deeper insight. So again, making the best use of each person's ability and looking for whose gifts line up with the foundations and allowing them to, because they're gonna do it naturally anyway. Um, and then we know when somebody in the team's got a gift that lines up for that, it, it's kind of baked into the, the organization, so. Yes, spot on. Just, I've noticed, I've, um, I find the chats a bit distracting, to be honest, but I did notice one pop, pop up just then, and given we've all mentioned it several times, um, the JR Foundations, Lou, you've got your card there, I can tell you you're looking at it. Can you please just read those four foundations? So um, actually, four before you do, uh, just everyone, uh, on the Lean Frontiers website, it didn't state the finish time for this discussion and the finish time will be quarter to the hour. So I apologize for not saying that first. For those who are listening live, the finish time will be quarter to the hour, so another 10 minutes. So Lou, yes, yeah, so you could just run through those foundations. Please. See if I can read them backwards. So I, I printed them up large because my eyes are 57 years old. And um, so the job relations card, the Ford Foundations, foundations, the first foundation is let each worker know how he or she is doing. And under that are two sub points. First is to figure out what you expect of the person and to point out to the ways to improve. The second foundation is to give credit when due. And the sub points there are to look for extra unusual performance, tell the person while it's hot. And along those lines, when patients come in and are incredibly thankful for me getting them in, it's not me, it's the front desk people. So as soon as that happens, I tell the, peop the, the patients that, and then I will make a beeline to the front desk people to say, look how thankful they are. The third one is tell people in advance about what changes will, will affect them. Sub points are tell them why if possible and work with them to accept the change. The last, the fourth, um, foundation is make the best use of each person's ability and the two sub points there are to look for abilities not now being used and never stand in a person's way and, and i think that rebecca story you've got is the never stand in a person's way i think that's a terrific example of what she really loves doing is being a mum <laughs> and you've been able to marry the two it's a brilliant story of how, uh, how you do that uh, I interrupted you. You were going to say something? Oh, I'm just at the very bottom of, of the card and the critical piece is, and I don't know if that shows up there or not, people must be treated as, as individuals. Um, to me, that's another very profound thing, right? That it, treating everybody the same is one of the most unfair things that you can do. Yeah. And, and I think much of HR attempts to treat everyone the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Spot on, thank you. Um, now let's go from a very positive to completely negative, perhaps. Not really, it's a positive question. It's, it's a negative question, but there's a, a I'm sure Mel will have a positive response. So Scott Ox asks, what's the best way to give negative feedback, Mel? Well, I, I'm glad you said positive, negative, because to me it is a positive. Um, <laughs> What since JR, and, and I will say that the JR training has probably helped me with this more than anything, because, you know, if you think back in, as being a manager, probably the least favorite conversations are the negative conversations by human nature. Most of us do not naturally enjoy having negative conversations or tough conversations with um, our, our teammates or our, our team. So um, through JR, though, I, it taught me that I am actually not helping my people if I'm not telling them, giving them honest feedback. And so I would say that that was one of my biggest learnings from JR is that for me personally, in reflection, is that I was overall kind of a positive, I was a very positive leader. I always was looking for positive, lots of positive reinforcement. I probably did the... Um, the foundations 
as far as, you know, giving credit when due and telling people when it's hot and looking for talent, you know, those were all the things that I probably was already naturally doing okay in. The negative conversations were probably the ones that I didn't like because I was really a positive person and I tried to be a positive leader. But I learned through JR that if I'm not being open, upfront, and honest with that individual, then they're not going to succeed. And so in essence, I was actually being harmful to them and to their development and to future opportunities that they may have by maybe not bringing forth some of the negative feedback that I needed to give to them. And so for me now, I look at it as a, an opportunity to help that individual. And so, and I think if you have a relationship with that person, if you have a trusting relationship, then when you do bring forth something that that individual needs to work on, then it is well received because they trust you. They trust that, that you're giving them that feedback for the right reasons that you're not trying to be, you know, demeaning or, um, just negative that you truly do care about them as a person and that you want them to succeed. And so typically that's how I will um, handle that is one, I make sure I have a trusting relationship with that person, but then I also want to give them that feedback and I always want to let them know that I feel that they deserve to know that feedback that for their own future development, they need to be aware of that. Um, you know, the other thing that I even encourage co when I do um, presentations to employee groups that I will talk about JR and the fact that we're using this with our supervisors and um, that we hope that they see that in their supervisors, managers, and directors. One thing that I tell them is, you know, as an employee, I know you would much rather hear that from your supervisor as for people to be talking about you behind your back, because that's what's happening, right? Most of the time people know who the low performers are, or they know who is not pulling the weight, or they know somebody that's done something that they shouldn't do. So what's happening is they're just talking about it. And so we want supervisors that feel comfortable having that conversation with the employee, because that's the respectful thing to do. It's much more respectful for a leader to bring an employee in and talk to them about what um, low performance or whatever the issue is, instead of that person not knowing so that they cannot correct that issue. And so what, what I find a lot of times in management is that people do steer away from those tough conversations. And it's really only at the detriment of the employees and the entire team because it's not addressed. It's just really more so talked about behind that person. So. I think the two things I picked up there, Mel, were opportunity and honesty. So um, the opportunity comes from the objective um, that, that you have for the person. Uh, the key is the honesty because you're doing them a disservice to be by, by at the end of the day by Absolutely. being by not being yeah. honest. And, and so don't you, sugar, you know don't sugarcoat it. It doesn't need to. Yeah. It needs to be open and honest. Yes. So if you have opportunity through your objective, if you've got the facts and you're honest, um, that's a pretty good place to start. Yeah. Spot on. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. Brad, how do you hold people accountable without losing their trust in what you're trying to accomplish? That came from Sally Gatlin. How do you hold people accountable without losing their trust in what you're trying to accomplish? Builds on what Melanie was just saying. Um, you, you hold people accountable by clearly understanding what's, what's expected. So You'll lose their trust if it's not clear they're being held to account to a standard that doesn't marry in with what you're saying your objective is. So they've got, they've got to see how the behaviour or, or the performance doesn't link through to what the organisation or, or the leadership goal is. So if, if you're off, off uh, addressing, holding people accountable for things that may not matter to the objective, they get, it'll cause confusion. So you've got to be honest. Um, and have that accountability conversation and it's got to be very clear. Um, I think that's where the objective setting and, and data-driven decisions, all those things make sense because you can't be subjective uh, with accountability. Um, you get inconsistency. So if you've got clear goals, uh, it's very easy to be clear in your accountability. But if you've got wishy-washy things that don't align um, when you're holding people account, they'll get confused. So you've got to be, it's got to be very clear, concise, and objective 
and respectful, but um, that's, I've only got a short period of time, but that's the way I do it, is to say that you, got, you, you, you can't, um, you've got to demonstrate how the accountability piece fits in with the, the objective. Yeah, spot on. I think um, for me, it ties very much in with this first sub foundation of the main foundation, which is figure out what you expect of the person. I, some, I, you know, pe people say, oh yeah, they've got job descriptions, they've got this, they've got that, but uh, it's not really what we mean here. Are we every for every five minutes, every ten minutes, every hour? Does the person clearly understand what's expected of them for that next hour? And what I find is that when you really press that point, often we don't. Often the person doesn't. Um, and then when they don't, you're in a, uh, a spiral, you're not in a good place. So I think that's what, that's what I picked up from that. Now, so that does finish our time, but what I am going to do, I know there's a particular question Lou wanted to answer. So we are gonna go over time. Those who need to leave, I truly understand them um, and uh, won't be blaming if you do have to leave, but Lou will take, I'd say two or three minutes to answer this question for those who want to hang around. And the question is, Lou, uh, how does job relations relate to the other pieces, job instruction and job methods? Yeah, I love that question. And it, it, it gets to, so Melanie works with um, Skip Stewart, who's just an incredible, incredible servant leader. And, and Melanie is in an amazing organization down in, she's in Jonesboro, um, the organization is Baptist Healthcare System. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, Melanie, I think there's 20 hospitals in the system or so that, and Skip and Patrick Grupp, um, who's a teammate of Oscars, have a book connecting the dots. And I, I think JR is this critical component of, so what's happening in the best organizations? Again, to me, that feedback loop is, the organization is there first and foremost to support the individuals in their family so that they can keep food on the table, a roof over their head. And ideally then you're helping individuals grow to their fullest and you're aligning within that organization, the growth of each soul that's working there with the work of the organization. And you're using stewardship Right? So whatever you're doing, Melanie's in healthcare, I'm in healthcare, um, Brad is working in the, the local government, Toyota makes cars, other people make widgets. But whatever you're doing, you wanna, you're, you're delivering that to the community. That's how you're serving the community. And through stewardship, you get better and better and better at doing that. Um, so you're gonna deal with how do we bring people and processes together and how do we grow human beings? And we think this is about process improvement, but my take is, is that it's about human improvement. It's about individual improvement and it's through the processes that we grow. And I, that question I think is that it, all the dots connect and, and all those pieces work together. What I'll pick up there, Lou, I haven't heard it said before is it brings the combination of the three brings people and process together. And I think that's critical. Um, that's, I've never thought of it that way, but when I think about it, JR, job relations, job instruction, job methods, being, brings people and process together. That makes sense to me in a, in, in a, in a, to, as a very short summary. So well done. Thank you, uh, Mel. First day back from holidays. Appreciate you um, uh, jumping straight into this and, uh, but yeah, as I said, very much appreciate being thrown straight in after having a week off. Brad, uh, I know it's, you had to get up at four o'clock to get to work to be able to do this. And I'm very impressed with the way uh, your yeah, suit and tie. So that's spot on. <laughs> and uh, so thanks for doing it. Lou, uh, always appreciate it's not It's not hard to read those essays that you send me. I just do have to pick the time. I must admit, I don't read them at the end of the day. I read them first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. So thanks. And Keep sending them and thanks very much for your insights uh, into uh, some quite deep stuff in job relations. So thanks guys, appreciate it. Appreciate the time you've put into this second time around just as much as the first. Uh, Skylar, Lean Frontiers, did you want to say anything? I don't really have much to say except thank you all panelists and thank you to everybody who is participating.
today for sending all of your questions into us. Thank you so much. And we didn't get through that many. And yet uh, again, uh, there was a lot left over. We had some very good ones and thank you. And there will be a recording available. I noticed someone asked about that, um, uh, Skylar, that you make this recording available, don't you? Yes, it is available. I will send the recording out to all who participated today. All who registered, yep, no worries. Yes. All right, thanks very much. Have a great day wherever you are in the world. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.